Hi, I'm Alexander Young. I'm going to talk about heritability estimation and gene environment correlation. Heritability measures the fraction of trait variation in a population that is due to genetic inheritance. Heritability becomes much more complicated to estimate when genes and an environment are correlated, which makes it hard to statistically distinguish the effects of genes and environment. While that is true for estimating heritability, it is also true for estimating the effect of inheriting a genetic variant at a single SNP, such as in standard genome-wide association studies, which regress the phenotypes of a set of individuals onto their genotypes. And when you do this, and that particular SNP is correlated with the environmental influences on the trait, your estimate of the effect of inheriting that SNP will be biased in proportion to the correlation between that SNP and the environmental effects on the trait. The type of gene environment correlation that has received the most attention in genome-wide association studies is population stratification, which occurs when different subpopulations that differ genetically also differ in their environments and those environments affect the trait in question. I'm showing here an image that shows the different genetic clusters present within the United Kingdom, which demonstrates that even in a relatively homogeneous population such as the United Kingdom, distinct genetic clusters exist, and if those genetic clusters differ in their environments for a particular trait that you're analyzing, that could lead to biases in the estimates of SNP effects on that trait when those SNPs are differentiated between the different subpopulations. Another potentially trickier form of gene environment correlation comes from a phenomenon that we've called parental genetic nurture, it's also being called indirect genetic effects. And this is when genotypes in relatives such as parents affect the trait of an individual through their environment. So typically we think of genetic effects as coming from inheriting a particular allele and that allele exerts an influence on your trait through your biochemical development, behavior. But any allele that you inherited was also present in at least one of your parents and would have affected their traits as well. For example, if you inherited an allele that increased your educational attainment, it might have also increased the educational attainment of at least one of your parents. And through doing that, affected your own educational attainment through the environment provided for you by your parents. It's not simply parents that can have indirect genetic effects on you though. It's also siblings, grandparents, etc. Any indirect effect from a relative can generate a bias in, in the estimate of a effect of a SNP or polygenic score or heritability as we'll go into later. And that's because your genotypes are correlated with your relative's genotypes. So this is inherently leading to gene environment correlation when your environment is partially a function of the genes of your relatives. However, these kind of phenomena of indirect genetic effects and even more sophisticated understanding of population stratification is often ignored in the standard models used in genome-wide association studies and human genetics. Simply, of, usually model of phenotype is simply the, the sum of some sort of direct genetic effect in some kind of environmental noise term that's independent of the of the genotype and that's assuming that there's no gene environment correlation so that the phenotypic variance is simply decomposed into a genetic component and a environmental slash noise component. However, the randomization of genetic material that occurs during meiosis can be used to construct a more general model for the effect of genetic variants on, on, on traits that takes into account gene environment correlation. So what this, what I'm showing here is, is simply that the offspring genotype is determined by the genotype of the mother and the genotype of the father, and then the random segregation events that occur in the mother and the father that determine which of each of the two copies of alleles in the mother and the father are inherited. And what this means is that given the 
genotype of the mother and the genotype of the father, all that remains to determine the offspring genotype is this are these random segregations that are independent of the environment. And what that means, and what I'm showing here, is that the offspring genotype is conditionally independent of the environment given the genotypes of the mother and the father. That enables you to write the environmental component of the trait, decompose it into a component that's correlated with the genotype of the parents and a residual component that's uncorrelated with the parental and offspring genotype. This thereby allows us to write the trait in a way that captures gene environment correlation in this eta term in front of the parental genotype, which can capture indirect genetic effects, population stratification, actually also assorted of mating. By writing the trait in this way, it allows us to understand exactly what we are estimating using standard GWAS methods that regress individuals' phenotypes onto their genotypes. And the expected estimate you get from, from the standard GWAS methods is the direct effect of inheriting the genetic variant delta plus eta, this term which captures gene environment correlation and includes contributions from indirect genetic effects from parents and other relatives, population stratification, and assorted of mating. And we can also derive from this way of writing the trait that if we jointly regress the phenotype onto of an individual onto their genotype and their parents' genotype, this gives us an unbiased es estimate of the direct effect of inheriting a genetic variant. And using parental genotypes to distinguish direct and indirect ef effects was what we did, or what I did in collaboration with others at DECODE in this paper that was published in Science in 2018, where we used the, a polygenic score, a genetic predictor of educational attainment, and tried to figure out what fraction of the predictive power of that educational attainment polygenic score comes from direct versus indirect effects by taking advantage of genetic data on parents and offspring in the Icelandic data, we found that only around one half of the predictive power of the educational attainment score derives from direct genetic effects, with most of the other half coming from indirect genetic effects and also the correlation between direct and indirect genetic effects of SNPs. So this shows you that what we often think of as genetic prediction is not purely the result of the genes you actually inherit, it can also be the result of the genes that are present in your relatives. So what does all of this mean for heritability estimation? Well, we first have to define what heritability is. Heritability is the fraction of trait variation in a population due to genetic inheritance. And it's the fraction due to direct genetic effects alone. Although the Indirect effects from parents are legitimate genetic effects in a sense. Traditionally, heritability is thought of as the variation only explained by the effect of inheritance of, a, of an allele, not as presence in a relative. And that's how twin studies have traditionally defined heritability. So that's the definition that we're going to use. But it is in contradiction to the way it has sometimes been used or is used without people realizing it. We can use the more general way of writing genetic effects on trait that takes into account gene environment correlation and direct genetic effects to derive a more general decomposition of the phenotypic variance that takes into account gene environment correlation. And in this decomposition, the, the phenotypic variance is equal to the, the sum of the genetic variance, so that's the, the variation explained by direct genetic effects plus the variance explained by gene environment correlation in some sense, the component of the environmental effect on the trait that's correlated with parental genotype and also capture some element of assortative mating too. And the covariance between genetic and environmental influences on a trait along with a residual environmental variance component comes from the component of the environment that's uncorrelated with offspring and parent genotype. 
So given that this gene environment correlation, this can aid in our understanding of different methods of estimating heritability. And one of the key properties of certain kinds of gene environment correlations, such as indirect genetic effects, is that they lead to a general increase in environmental similarity with genetic relatedness. It's very clear to see this with indirect genetic effects. As people become more related, their parents become more related. So if their genes become more correlated, their parents' genes become more correlated. So as you increase up the relatedness spectrum, you increase similarity in indirect genetic effects. So simply seeing phenotypic correlation increasing with genetic similarity it's not evidence for direct genetic effects on its own. It can also be indirect genetic effects or some other phenomenon, environmental phenomenon that, that just becomes more similar as people become more related. And given that, you can understand the different methods of estimating heritability and the potential biases they might have due to gene environment correlation by thinking about where in this space of phenotypic correlation versus genetic relatedness on the y and x axes do these oper do these estimators get their information from and, and these estimators typically are fitting some sort of linear relationship to points in in this space of phenotypic correlation and genetic relatedness at a high level at least so the traditional twin estimator that compares the phenotypic similarity of monozygotic twins to dizygotic twins that estimator of heritability is the gradient of this blue line here. And the key assumption that twin studies make is that there's no greater environmental similarity of monozygotic over dizygotic twins, which we know not to be true, but the quantitative impact of this bias on twin estimates of heritability remains controversial. More recently, methods based on genotyping SNP arrays, such as GRAML, Genomic Relatedness Restricted Maximum Likelihood, have become popular and this method looks at how phenotypic similarity changes with genetic relatedness estimated from a set of genome-wide SNPs for only distantly related individuals. And while this avoids certain biases due to certain kinds of environmental effects shared between close relatives, it does not avoid bias due to indirect genetic effects as I will go into in more detail later. Another less well-known method is one that I call the kinship method and this looks at how phenotypic similarity changes with relatedness from from for a random sample from a population that includes some closely related pairs some less closely related pairs lots of distantly related pairs and this method was actually employed in the Icelandic data in a public paper published in 2013 it's also employed in some Scottish data in a paper published in 2018 that looked at IQ and education and height. And the issue with this method is it really has no principled way to distinguish between similarity due to genes, to shared genetic inheritance, and similarity due to shared environment. So it's liable to overestimate heritability when environment, environmental similarity increases with genetic relatedness. A more robust method was developed by Peter Vischer in 2006, and this looks at how phenotypic similarity changes with relatedness restricted to sibling pairs. So siblings vary in their relatedness due to the random segregations that occur in the parents, whether the siblings inherit zero, one or two copies the same from their parents, over the genome generates this distribution of relatedness that I'm showing here. And because that distribution of relatedness is generated by these random segregations in the parents that are independent of environment, looking at how phenotypic similarity changes with relatedness for siblings gives a quite robust way, a very robust way of estimating heritability even when gene environment correlation is present the main issue with this method is that it requires hundreds of thousands of genotype sibling pairs with phenotype information to get precise estimates of heritability. And no such analysis has ever been done, so this method has never really settled any of the controversies about, about heritability of human traits.
And so what I did primarily while I was in Iceland was generalize this idea of SIP regression to all relative pairs. So you can see on this plot here where the y-axis is the relatedness, the x-axis is the parental relatedness, the, the SIP, there's this big variation in relatedness for siblings and around their expectation given the parental relatedness, which is something you can derive based on the laws of Mendelian inheritance. And that's what SIP regression uses. However, if you have informa genetic information on the parents, you can compute this relatedness coefficient between the parents of one individual and the parents of another individual. And then given that relatedness coefficient, you can compute the expected relatedness between the offspring of one set of parents and the offspring of another set of parents. And that's shown by this diagonal line here. But there is still variation around the expectation line, this vertical variation and relatedness around the expectation given the parents. And that variation around the expectation is generated by random segregations in the parents. And those segregations are independent of environmental effects. So what that means is if instead of simply looking at how phenotypic similarity changes with relatedness, you look at how phenotypic similarity changes with these deviations around expected relatedness, you actually remove all of the bias that can be present in heritability estimates due to gene environment correlation, because you're simply using that component of relatedness that's generated by random segregations independent of environment. And that relates back to the variance decomposition that we talked about before. And you can decompose the covariance between individuals into a component arising from direct genetic effects where that covariance is given by their relatedness. The covariance due to the environmental component correlated with parental genes. And that covariance is given by this relatedness coefficient between parents, parents of one individual, parents of another individual. And there's covariance between individuals due to covariance between genetic and environmental effects. And that covariance is given by the relatedness between the offspring of one set of parents and the other set of parents, and the offspring of that set of parents and the complementary set of parents. And if you fit this model, it includes those three different relatedness matrices that are actually highly correlated, but there is independent information in all of them. I proven that this covariance model, fitting this covariance model, gives a consistent estimator of the heritability, even when you have indirect genetic effects and population stratification, all these forms of gene environment correlation. And this is what I did and took, then took advantage of the 55,000 Icelanders who have both parents genotyped in, in the decode data to estimate heritability for 14 different quantitative traits and, and see if there's evidence for bias in heritability estimates due to gene environment correlation. So here I'm comparing estimates from this method I developed, relatedness disequilibrium regression or RDR, to estimates from the kinship method, which just looks at how phenotypic similarity changes with relatedness. Well, and, and, and this method actually also includes some modeling of shared family environment between siblings. Nevertheless, you see substantially larger heritability estimates from the kinship method for height, educational attainment, BMI, age at first child and women, and on average across 14 traits, the kinship estimates are 12% higher than the RDR estimates, showing that there is likely to be substantial gene environment correlation that's leading to bias in heritability estimates. And I also compared to twin studies, but one thing about the Icelandic population is it's so small there aren't enough twins to do a proper twin study. So I compared to what I thought was the next best thing, which is Swedish twins. And the Swedish twin estimates are a lot higher on average and for every trait than the RDR estimates, a mean difference of 33% of the phenotypic variance. And that seems like a large difference to me. So there could be some differences due to having different samples that are not due to the method. Nevertheless, such a large difference to me indicates that twin estimates and, and genomic estimates, they are properly controlling for environment. They're giving different answers, and, and this could be evidence for overestimation of heritability by twin studies.
I also compared twin estimates to estimates from the SIB progression methods. It just looks at the variation relatedness in, in siblings in Iceland, and, and that was actually by far the biggest application of the SIB progression method that has been done. But even so, the estimates of heritability are so noisy as to be not particularly useful at an individual trait level. But across the traits, you can see nevertheless that the twin estimates tend to be considerably higher. And while the previous methods I've been showing you were using relatedness estimated from identity by descent segments, and when you estimate heritability using relatedness computed from those segments, you should estimate something close to the full heritability that captures all of the genetic effects on trait, not just common SNPs or ones that are in linkage disequilibrium with SNPs on a genotyping array. That's not the case for typical applications of Gremmel methodologies, which compute relatedness from a set of genome-wide SNPs, often just the genotyping array SNPs, sometimes imputed SNPs, and they capture only the component of the phenotypic variance that is explained by effects of SNPs in linkage disequilibrium with the SNPs that are input into the relatedness calculation, so they're not going to capture the full heritability, but they do have more power and they have more power in part because there's more variation in relatedness estimated from SNPs than relatedness estimated from IBD segments. So I'm comparing here relatedness estimated from IBD on the x-axis in Iceland to relatedness estimated from genome-wide SNPs. And you see even when there are no detectable IBD segments between a pair of individuals, so I, the uh, IBD relatedness is zero, there's still quite a lot of variation in the SNP relatedness, and this is just due to whether they happen to have the same or different SNPs at, at various locations, whether they are shared due to some recent common ancestor or not, in this case they're not. And this greater variation gives you more power, but it, it doesn't actually estimate the full genetic component. Furthermore, the Grammel method is, is strongly susceptible to bias due to indirect genetic effects. I demonstrated this through simulations in the UK Biobank, where they took advantage of a sample of people with, with both parents genotyped. And here the, the heritability of the simulated trait was 20%. Uh, yes, and I simulated also parental genetic nurturing effects. And when you include the parental genetic nurturing effects, indirect effects, the total variance explained by the direct and indirect effects of the inherited alleles goes for up from 20% to 35.56%. And the Grammel estimate of heritability is very close to this total variance explained by the direct and indirect effects of the inherited alleles in line with the theoretical expectation that I had and in relation to those variance components. Whereas a SNP version of RDR, whereas instead of using IBD to estimate the relatedness matrices, I showed before, you just use SNPs, so it's like an RDR version of the standard Gremmel method, um, you get what is essentially an unbiased estimate of the heritability. And I, I looked at this in real data in Iceland, although because Iceland's a small population, whenever you have a large sample, you end up with a lot of close relative pairs, so I couldn't quite use the standard Gremmel statistical method for fitting the model. So I use a slightly different one, and that's what's on the y-axis, but it's essentially equivalent to what you would get from doing Gremmel on unrelated individuals. And I compared that to the RDR estimates using the same SNP data that went into the, the Gremmel type method. And I found significantly higher estimates for educational attainment, age of first child in women, and height. And it's likely that the difference for educational attainment in age of first child in women is due to indirect genetic effects, primarily from parents. These, this increase in heritability estimates consistent with what we found from the polygenic score. For height, there could be some contribution from population stratification and assortative mating. But nevertheless, this is a illustration that these estimates were getting from Gremmel methods and, and it would also apply to LD score regression estimates of heritability are not 
really estimating the heritability as traditionally defined. They're more estimating some kind of theoretical maximum R squared you get from a linear model of all those SNFs, which includes direct and indirect genetic effects, and potentially also population stratification. So in conclusion, genes mm -hmm. and environment tend to be correlated. It's population stratification and indirect genetic effects contributing to that. And especially for traits that have a, a strong influence of the family, you would expect indirect genetic effects to be present in that to generate this kind of gene-environment correlation that can only really be separated out by using genetic data on families. And when you have the genetic data on families, this randomization of genetic material that occurs during meiosis, that is really the key to getting unbiased estimates of direct causal effects of genetic variants, separating that out from other sources of genotype phenotype association but to do this successfully we're going to need to collect a lot more genetic data on families